Good evening. Now, the focus of this 29th Camden Conference, the new Africa, is timely. Why? Because our beloved continent, and I speak here as an African rather than as a reporter, Africa is an extraordinary continent with extraordinary people. There's no doubt about that. All how many hundred millions of us? And just like you, Africans are striving for a better life, for the continent and for its people. Good jobs, reliable health care, access to food and education for their children, freedom and justice and respect. In the 30 odd years that I've been reporting on Africa, this continent has transformed and continues its transformation despite the very many ups and downs. I travel around Africa constantly, and I'm always amazed by the can-do, will-do, am-doing attitude of so many enterprising people on our continent, in spite of often poor, disappointing, or failed leadership in so many countries. Take Nigeria. It's a good example, and it is West Africa's giant. And this isn't a reflection of the current leadership, since the jury is still out on President Muhammadu Buhari's less than one year in the job. But Nigeria as a whole I'm talking about. As one friend put it, you rarely see a Nigerian looking defeated. There is a spirit that just soars, a unique, funky mix of friendship and feistiness all mapped against an often baffling backdrop of persistent corruption. We can't get away from that. But there's also deep personal faith and a willingness to succeed, come what may. That's the people. Yes, Nigeria has immense problems, of course. But that does not stop people from striving, thriving, achieving, and aspiring for better. It's true, there's only one Niger. That's the nickname for Nigeria, Niger. Nigerians don't spend their time hand-wringing. They don't have time for that. They get up and they go. They get on with it. There's a Nigerian song that I love. It's called Shake Body, Shake Body. <laughs> now that can mean, you know, shake body and dance, but it can also mean get up and go. It's pidgin English. And you know, that's an expressive, inventive, creative, singular African language that unites all of West Africa and way beyond, because it gets straight to the point. You don't go and switch off the light, you off the light. You don't put someone on your lap, you lap them. You know, <laughs> we're laughing, but it just, it cuts out the unnecessary and go straight to the point. And that is important for us. So, oh yeah, shake body. Whenever I hear this song, it makes me jump up. It makes me want to dance and it makes me want to get going. So let us all shake body at the Camden Conference over the weekend. <laughs> I have to admit, this is not a scientific endeavor. This is going to be anecdotal, and these are my observations as a reporter, snapshots of the continent, where Africa is today, and where it may be heading, the new Africa. You know, it was when I agreed that I thought, my goodness, these are huge subjects, and I can't do justice to such a vast canvas in this time, in this evening. So these will indeed be sketches. Let's take technology for starters. You saw those two young ladies doing their selfies. Nigerian-American writer and journalist Dayo Olupade, do read her book. I think I brought a copy here. The Bright Continent, Breaking Rules and Making Change in Modern Africa. It's a good one. It is. She says, the technology map is the best kept secret in sub-Saharan Africa. 
the exciting terrain where need and genius meet. Explosive rates of internet use and cell phone penetration are creating an entirely new foundation for service delivery, information dissemination, and economic growth. So says Dayo Lopode, or Lopade. And I agree wholeheartedly, technology is revolutionizing the continent. And you see evidence of this every day. Let me offer you a couple of examples here. Okay, this may not be an entirely positive one, but there's positive in the end in some respects. It illustrates my point. MTN Nigeria, and as I'm sure you know, MTN is a giant South African based cell phone provider, which got a head start in Nigeria years ago. Vision. You can't go wrong, surely, selling cell phones and SIM cards to a potential 200 million people. But success went pear-shaped in December when MTN Nigeria was initially fined $5.2 billion, an industry record, I hear. $5.2 billion by the Nigerian telecoms regulator. Why? Because MTN failed to deactivate more than 5 million unregistered SIM cards. The Nigerian authority said having all these unregistered SIMs is a national security threat because extremists use such cell phone numbers in their deadly attacks, we've heard a lot about that, Boko Haram and others, or for remotely detonating bombs, and criminals make use of these bogus unregistered SIMs for abductions, for mighty ransoms, and armed robberies. That's important, but it's not my point. Just consider that figure of five million SIM cards. That is phenomenal. It shows the deep penetration of cell phone usage in Nigeria, which is replicated to a lesser degree with smaller populations, of course, in other parts of Africa, leapfrogging fixed line technology and powering ahead. And that for me is one of the most visible advances and evidence of progress in Africa that shows the continent is taking and making huge strides, despite the problems. Take Mpesa, M for mobile, mobile phone, and Pesa means money in Swahili, I believe. So even the name is clever and relevant. This mobile money transfer system that began in Kenya with Safaricom began in what? About 2008, I think it was and it has mushroomed and spawned similar systems all over Africa, streets ahead of anything you find in the US or the West. It has changed banking. It means that people are able, literally by pressing a button on their phone to send money to their families or to send phone credit or to pay bills. I remember at the time, after the post-election crisis in Kenya, I was interviewing the CEO of Safaricom in Nairobi, Michael Joseph, and he was excitedly explaining and demonstrating how Impesa, which of course was new then, how it worked, but, and he pinged me some credit onto my cell phone long before smartphones became the norm. You know, and I, I kept that cell phone and I kept that tiny bit of credit, he said, because it I thought, my goodness, this seems simple, but in fact, it's totally revolutionary. I can't say that I, I predicted that it would go, in inverted commas, viral, but it has just taken over the world. Everywhere you go in Africa now, has its equivalent of Impesa. People who may not have access to bank accounts because they don't have that amount of money that's needed to open a bank account. But it doesn't mean that they can't do banking of sorts because they can use Impesa or any of these systems. You know, when Safaricom floated on the market, I said to myself, oh, I missed an opportunity there. 
<laughs> I, I should have invested. Of course, you can't because um, it would be a conflict of interest. But I mean, look how money transfers are being used in Africa. And these are the, perhaps not the obvious stories that I report or that other, rep other people, other journalists report. We're, we're always being accused of being Afro-pessimists, of only reporting what is negative, only reporting war and conflict and disease. Even the video there by the CPB showed me covering conflict and covering disease. And we have to do that, of course. That is part of life and part of Africa. But there is also progress. The cover of the program of this year's Camden Conference of a Maasai herder consulting his cell phone, standing in front of a frail looking herd of cows with poverty marks on their flanks is really telling. So many Africans are consulting their cell phones to gather information and act independently, be it Kenyan or Nigerian farmers receiving text messages to pick up fertilizer provided at the cost of the Ministry of Agriculture, bypassing those middlemen who used to push up the prices. And now you can be standing on your farmland, surrounded by your harvest of maize, corn, millets, and call to find out how much the market price is, say, in your capital city. You can do that directly. So you know and you get the full benefit. It's not that middleman who used to profit from your hard work on the farm. I met a Senegalese farmer, Mariama Keita, last year in the build-up to the Climate Change Summit in Paris. And she was clutching her cell phone, not a smartphone, common or garden cell phone. It's become a tool in her farming arsenal, like a hoe or a shovel or a horse, that's the beast of burden. She said she'd love a tractor. I couldn't help her with that. Mariama told me how getting climate, weather, and farming information via SMS, via text message, on her cell phone from Senegal's meteorological office has changed her life, allowed her to farm smartly and to generate income for herself and her family. Just by knowing when the rain will fall and when to harvest crops, millets and groundnuts, you call them peanuts here, and when to protect the harvest from an unexpected downpour that could wipe out their profits. And now she's learned, she's passing on that knowledge to other farmers and members of her community. She proudly showed us her veranda that she had built onto her modest home in Cafrine in Senegal, the groundnut peanut belt. And she says, life is better. It's still hard, but it's getting better. She has money to send children in the family to school and to help her family. That, for me, is progress. It may be incremental, but embracing technological innovation, however basic, is an indication that Africa is moving forward. Slowly, I'll admit, but is moving forward. The same with online shopping. I know it's old hat in the US. But just a few years ago, in Ghana or Nigeria, or any of the other countries where online shopping and delivery is newish, this is modernizing how Africans consume. Of course, you still go to the market and you still get fresh produce and fruit and vegetables. But, you know, if you want to order a scarf, a pair of shoes, you order today and to your amazement, it's delivered tomorrow. Yeah, I know you're all used to that. But it's new in Africa. Jumia in Nigeria is just one example. Cash on delivery. So again, you don't need 
that bank account. People are innovating and people are doing new things. They're not waiting for the government to propel them forward or take them backwards, which is often the case. They're thinking up, they are delivering, and they are making the continent tick. I know I'm talking a great deal about Nigeria. It's a country I love. <laughs> but it throws up so many examples, so many challenges, so many contradictions. So a last quick word on technology, which I found in my email box this morning. The Nigerian president, Mohamed Buhari, yesterday appointed the renowned blogger and award-winning journalist, Tolu Ogunlesi, as his special assistant on digital stroke new media. This is Buhari, who in the early 80s was a military leader, dictator, whatever word you want to use. He now says he's a reformed Democrat. But our leaders finally seem to be getting the point. They're beginning to understand the importance of technology, communication, within their own countries and across their borders with other African countries and how this can propel a country or a continent forward. Let me talk a bit about citizen politics, if I can put it that way. Look how social media has been used extensively and successfully in revolutions and campaigns across the continent from Yonamar, which means we're fed up in French, that was the effort in Senegal to prevent former President Abdoulaye from seeking another term in office. A group of rappers used music and social media networking to galvanize their campaign four or five years ago, 2012. Wad was voted out of office. More recently, we've seen Ballet Citoyen, Citizen Suite, I guess we can translate it as, the campaign in Burkina Faso, a movement putting pressure on a sit-tight president, would-be coup makers, and others obstructing the will of the people who were trying to return their country to democratic government. They succeeded. And then take the hashtag fees must fall campaign in South Africa that forced President Jacob Zuma and the university authorities across the nation to back down and jettison a planned hike in tuition fees. People are using new media to change their countries and change their lives. Technology has played its part in these successful campaigns. The negative, third termism, the third term movement, or shall I call it the third term club of presidents who just can't envisage leaving office. I mean, what gives? <laughs> it's like deja vu, a virulent rash that keeps coming back, rolling back the clock a quarter of a century. Before it was the Mobutus of this world governing then Zaire forever. Mobutu Sesseko is long gone, but his neighbor in Congo Brazzaville is still hanging on. 20 years later. We now seem to have even more of them in Africa. Leaders who sit tight and try to secure third, fourth, fifth terms as president. Come on! Museveni in Uganda, he's just gone to elections. Kagame in Rwanda. Kabila in Democratic Republic of Congo. Sasu next door in Congo Brazzaville. Idris Debi in Chad. And let's not forget Pierre Nkurunziza of Burundi, whose third term bid has sparked the violence that has spiraled out of control and is threatening a region that has suffered genocide and turbulence in recent decades. And that's not to speak of Mugabe in Zimbabwe, Dos Santos in Angola, or Equatorial Guineas, or Biang. The club of presidential dinosaurs continues. Wasn't I reporting on this club 25, 30 years ago, before the flowering of democracy and multi-party politics? But there's hope. Look at Nigeria 2015. About a year ago, I was dreading heading back to Nigeria to cover the campaign leading up to elections at the end of March. Why? Because so often, voting had been violent before and after. 
and yet the voters' will prevailed, and Nigeria conducted mainly peaceful elections, and then proceeded to make history by booting out Good Luck Jonathan after just one full term in office, electing Buhari, the former military leader I mentioned. That is progress. Yes, it was a surprise. And Nigerians are mindful that change can happen. But now you have to build on that change. I was at Farnsworth Museum this morning. Peter Imba took us there. And art is in my heart. What makes me smile and, you know, this morning, getting the opportunity to just go there for uh, 45 minutes, what makes me happy is the growing numbers of African writers and their standing on the continent from east to west, north to south. I'm always saying our artists, writers, musicians and performers should be our leaders. Africa would be more thoughtful and get more done, more tunefully and infinitely more eloquently. We could do with reflective poet presidents. But to be honest, literature and the arts are flourishing in many parts of the continent. I'm heartened as I travel around Africa, meeting and talking to those who are really making our continent tick. A dear friend and Ivorian writer and artist, Veronique Tadjo, is right when she says African literature has acquired an enviable international status. Again, post Achebe, Tutuola, Ngugi, and Shoenka. The list is long. One of my favorites is Igoni Barrett. Try and get hold of his book of short stories. Love is power, or something like that. It's extraordinary. Breathtakingly inspirational writing coming out of Africa. Yes, music is another example. Angelique Kijo from Benin has just again won the World Music Grammy Award for Best Album. And she's one of those extraordinary musicians who encourages young African talent from South Africa to Senegal to remember their roots, but as she does, to collaborate with other musicians and other musical genres. It's true. Music breaks down barriers. Kijo said, I work with everyone who believes that music is the tool of peace. For me, music is the only form of art that connects the entire world. I tend to agree with that. I'm moving forward quickly because suddenly we're down to only a couple of minutes. So, how do we Africans think we have done in terms of our second wave of independence, post one party rule and colonialism? How far have we gone in reforming the political order and expanding our oh so important worldview? And I say that in inverted commas because I hear my friends Kawala, Mvemba Disolele, and Kingsley Chinedu Mogalu constantly refer to it. They're right. Kingsley writes in his authoritative book, Emerging Africa, another one that you must get hold of. Where are you? Hmm? Emerging Africa. To many, Africa is the new frontier. As the West lies shattered by financial crisis, Africa is seen as offering limitless opportunities for wealth creation in the march of globalization. He then goes on to roundly rubbish the Africa rising narrative. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about this from Kingsley. I say one solution is for us to invest in the youth, a vital group. Look at Rakia and Nyawal. Africa is young, half the continent is under 20. 70% 70 of the population is under 30. Africa boasts the youngest region on the globe, the proverbial youth bulge. But if you have no paid work and few prospects, you may be inclined to jump on a rickety boat and begin a perilous odyssey across the high seas or in a dodgy truck across the Sahara in search of that elusive better life or worse. Young people struggle to access education, jobs and prospects. Yet you are our future. Olapade, 
whose book I showed you just now concludes that the youth map is grounded in creative education methods that will make or break the future for us all. That is our challenge, Africa's challenge. Oya, oh yeah, shake body. Thank you. Ophelia, if I may, um, it was a wonderful tour d'horizon, diplomats like to say, and, and you gave us a terrific reading list, too. And uh, <laughs> So thank you so much. Now, this is the time at night of the, of the evening when, uh, when the audience is invited to partic participate in the citizen dialogue. We have uh, audiences in Rockfast and Rock, uh, <laughs> Bel Belfast and Rockport. Um, Rockfast and Belfast. Rockfast and Belfast, that's right. And uh, so if, if they are invited to write down questions and give them to the citizens, to the volunteers who are in the aisles there and here in here in, here, here in Camden, um, we have volunteers who will collect your questions and, and, and pose them to us. And while, all of us, while you're thinking about all of that and it's going forward, let me exercise uh, my, my privilege uh, as moderator to ask the first question, if I may, um, and to invite you to sort of tell us more about the situation in Nigeria. You talked a good, a good deal about Nigeria. Uh, many of us remember were moved a couple of years ago now, almost two years ago, by the kidnapping of the girls in Borno State. Um, there have been efforts subsequently to, to free them. Um, most of them remain, I'm afraid, in captivity. There was a major effort by the United States to send an interagency team to Abuja, the Nigerian capital. Uh, we set up a drone base in neighboring Chad. Those that's all, that's all ended. Uh, can you bring us up to date on, on the search for the, for the girls in Borno State and uh, victims of, uh, of uh, Boko Haram and perhaps more broadly on then the fight against uh, Boko Haram in northern Nigeria? How long have you got? Two weeks? <laughs> I'm afraid it's a sorry story. President uh, Muhammadu Buhari <clears throat> promised that by the end of 2015, the army would have licked Boko Haram. Of course, that hasn't happened. It's true that they have been driven from their strongholds. They no longer hold territory. The caliphate that they said they were setting up hasn't happened. But as you say, 219 schoolgirls from Chibok are still missing. And they're just some of the abducted girls, boys, women, children who are still missing. And then you have tens of thousands more who are still in, you know, we say displaced people's camps, but they're refugees. Yeah. They're effective refugees in their own country. You have President Buhari who says that uh, we have effectively defeated Boko Haram. It's true the conventional fighting may be over, but that has not stopped attacks, hit and run attacks, suicide bombings, increasingly using girls and women because they're wearing the voluminous clothes and can hide the bombs. But having said that, last week it must have been, we reported on a young woman who <clears throat> tore off that belt of bombs. She and two others had been sent to a refugee camp in Borno State. Borno is the, Meiduguri, the capital of Borno, is really the heart of the Northeast, which has had seen the worst of this insurgency. She said, you know, apparently to the people who debriefed, 
damned if I do, damned if I don't. Her father apparently was at this refugee camp. So she felt if I go there, I could kill my own father. But then there was the fear of those who have sent her there. You know, you've been terrorized. She had already been driven from her home. Terrorized, traumatized, maybe perhaps brainwashed. What these people are struggling still. It's not over. Yeah. Um, one more question as a follow-up, if I may. Uh, it's a regional problem, obviously. The Lake Chad Basin, uh, some of it's, there's been a spillover into Chad and Cameroon and Niger to some extent. Uh -uh. Um, there's a multinational force cre that's been created with a headquartered in, uh, in, in Jemena, the Chadian capital, commanded by a Nigerian general, I, I believe. What's happened with that? Has there been any progress in this regional cooperation to defeat Boko Haram? A year ago, when the Chadians moved in, I think that everybody was fed up. They felt that Nigeria was not doing enough to try and deal with the Boko Haram problem. And you had what looked like a regional coalescence, the, mm -hmm. the formation of a regional multinational force. And it's true that together they drove Boko Haram from the towns and villages mm. that they had held. We hear far less now, yes. although we're being told that there is more discussion between, for example, the Cameroonians and the Nigerians, the Nigerians and the Nigerians, the Chadians and the Nigerians, but it seems to have gone rather quiet on that front, although the attacks continue in all these countries still. Thank you. Let's turn to our audience here, I think, and let's see. Yes, sir, in the, on the aisle there. We need our volunteers to bring you the microphone. Uh, Jim Matlack, thank you so much for that vivid, quick overview. We are in the midst of an election <clears throat> with some very problematic candidates for president. No. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? But, but let's imagine a sensible person is elected and will take office at the beginning of next year. What are the two or three basic things you would say to that president coming in that would most positively affect U.S. policy toward Africa? One, treat Africans as equals, not as just recipients of aid. Two, continue the cooperation security. I think that has become, in the eight years of the Obama administration, security across the continent has really deteriorated from across the Sahel all the way to Somalia. And I think you mentioned that the Americans came in to try and help Nigeria. We were told that there was some quarreling between the Americans and the Nigerians. They withdrew those advisors. But too many people are suffering. But it has got to be, don't come and impose your will on Africa. That's not going to work. There are new generations. They don't want to be dictated to. They want to be treated as equals. And I think anyone, whoever wins the US election, has got to understand that. Times have changed. That's great, thank you. Where's our second? Here we are, over here. John Burstein, and again, thank you very much for your, your talk. When you speak of Africa, it seems to me that you're obviously speaking of the entire continent um, versus different countries. And you, we seem to be talking about identifying yourself more as an African than as a, a Senegalese or something like that. Uh, I'm just curious about it. It's, it's as if here in the North American continent, I mean, there's clearly, I mean, there's only two countries here, but you know, America and Canada, uh, but Americans don't, I mean, they feel they're the United States. There's something about the way you're talking as if there's a homogenous Africa independent of the states themselves, or the countries that make up Africa. Like there's an African sensibility that transcends individual things. And I'm curious about your feeling about that. I think perhaps because I'm a Pan-Africanist. Yes, I'm a Ghanaian, I come from Ghana. But I do think that it's together 
that the continent is going to move forward, that if it's our individual 54 countries, each working on its own, be it with China, with the US, or with ourselves, we are not going to move forward. It has got to be a logical narrative, and it's the entire continent that needs to work together. Individually, we are not going to move forward. If I talk about Africa, it's true. You're quite right. Each country has its own identity, its own cultures, its own languages, its own customs and tradition. But if we're to talk about each individual country, it would take forever. So maybe it's lazy to talk about Africa, but I think of it as a continent, not as a country as we hear some people talk about Africa, not at all. <laughs> Thanks. I think of it as the component countries of a continent, but that it's as a continent that we need to move forward and that we need to strategize. Thank you. Yes, number two. David Noble, and thank you. What is the best thing that can be done to overcome the scourge of corruption? Mm, that's a big question. Kingsley? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, K- Kingsley will be talking to you about this, and Kawala. We had a, a, a dynamic discussion in the car that brought us up from uh, Portland Airport yesterday uh, with Mvemba as well. All of us trying to get in, chip in with our views. Of course, corruption is huge, and of course, it's endemic and not just in Nigeria or Democratic Republic of Congo or Ghana or South Africa. How do you tackle it? I'm going to say, let's listen to Kingsley tomorrow on that. It's a tough one. It really is a tough one because it's got to be rooted out at all levels. But as my friends were saying to me, but we mustn't, for example, Nigeria. I think it was Kingsley who said President Buhari has made this his one track, that that is his main fight. But you can't do it on its own. Everything has to come into it. You've got to make things, the political order better. You've got to provide for your people. Because otherwise, of course, corruption is going to continue running rampant, not just amongst the elite who may be stealing, but even those who are impoverished. Because if you don't have, you will find a way to get. And if that means dash and being dishonest, that will continue. And mind you, you have it here too, don't you? It's just more subtle and uh, a little more discreet. Yes, in the balcony. Uh, Good afternoon. Um, You describe technology as being a... um, disruptive technology, you described the cell phone and, and banking as being these, these things that are changing society in, across Africa. And I'm wondering if there's a corresponding social movement or new political movement, or whether we're just seeing <clears throat> capitalism repeated but in a more efficient manner, or whether something new is emerging, perhaps um, imitating the, the, the hope of, of the Arab Spring or something like that. Oh, where, we started th- before the Arabs. Mm-hmm. OK. We started okay. before, you know. Yeah. Yeah, we started but, before the Arabs. Uh-huh. You were describing the sort of contrast to, to, the, failing, to the failing European Union or the, fail, or the collapse of, I don't think you said the collapse of the West, but, but you sort of described the, the limitations of the West and this African rising. And I'm wondering if you can mention a little bit the, the corresponding social movements or uh, these, changing consciousness. The, the two that I'm, I gave you two examples of what have become social movements. Ballet Citoyen in Burkina Faso, the, the sweep citizen. And these are, you know, we loosely call them civil society. But these are groups that started small. And Yonama, we're fed up in Senegal, groups that started small, 
but really gained currency and gained supporters and followers because of what they were doing, because people considered them honest and effective. It's true that after the problem or when there has been a solution, you don't hear so much about these groups, but that doesn't mean they're not continuing their work. They are. Let me just, is it more, is it, is it simply a question of out with the old rascals before we bring in some new ones, or is there more to these social movements than simply opposition to uh, those in power? Often they are youthful movements. The Fees Must Fall campaign in South Africa, Yonamar. Yes. And it's, I think it's young people saying, hey, things must change, but not temporary change. Yes. We need to not just sweep out the old or the elderly or the sit tight presidents, but a fundamental change mm -hmm. in how our countries operate, how our countries work, and how our countries deal with other countries in, on the continent and beyond and amongst ourselves. So I don't think it's just them, the, especially the youth, yes. because they're the ones who are angry. They're the ones who don't have jobs. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who are graduates with no prospects. Yes. They are saying something has got to give. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's take a question from uh, one of our remote sites in Portland. And this is, uh, uh, we can read it here, maybe it's in front of us on the, ah. how can the world deal with failed states and terrorist ideologies that are causing mass migrations? And it's asked by Andy Cadeau in Portland. That's a huge one. <laughs> <laughs> it is a bit, but, <laughs> it is. But it's not just failed states and terrorist ideologies that are calling, causing mass migrations. As we've said, it's high unemployment mm -hmm. that is forcing young people to leave their countries of origin. In Senegal, there's, well, there's, it's true that there's a simmering rebellion in the South, but there's no war, there's no conflict. So why mm -hmm. do young, especially young Senegalese men, leave in droves. You know, I've described it as pride and pressure. You know, pressure from your family and you being proud, feeling that you have to provide for your family. Get on a boat that may sink. In, look what we saw with the migrants and refugees last year. Why would anyone take the risk? I can understand it if you're being driven out by terrorism or, but people are desperate. And if you are desperate, you're going to try and leave. There's a, not so young now, he used to be young, but a fantastic Senegalese rapper called Awadi, who he appeals to young Senegalese saying, Build your, build your country. Okay, things are not perfect. Okay, you may not have a job. Okay, you feel your life is not what it should be. But why are you taking your life into your own hands and crossing the high seas? To what future? You know, Europe and America are no longer the Eldorados. People are even trying to return home from these countries. Jobs are hard to get anywhere. Stay and build your own country. But then in the same breath, he says, but our leaders are letting us down. And I think that is really one of the huge problems in Africa, that after a period of, you know, a, a flourishing period of democracy, we seem to be rolling backwards. What has happened to all that hope? What has happen to all the promise when we see presidents who want a fifth term or a sixth term. I mean, these are the disappointments, but there's still hope. Mm. Yes. Sorry. Yes. 
Thank you. My name is Kristen Wainwright, and I have worked for a number of years in creating tools for self-determination in Tanzania. And what I hear very often now is about the importance of women in Tanzania, in tribes, in villages, in other countries, in terms of being able to affect ultimate and true change. I'm wondering if you could comment on that and also talk about any large successes you know that might reflect that viewpoint. Thank you. Large successes, perhaps not, because you'll find that um, women make Africa tick. Uh, that's, mm. I, I, it's true that I didn't mention it, but that is a reality. But it's not in a in-your-face sort of way. I mean, be it the market women of Ghana or of Congo, they are the ones make, and increasingly farmers. Farm, who does much of the farming in Africa? Women. But in the African sense, many women, don't, they get on with it. They don't stand and say, look at what I'm doing. Look at how successful I am. Look at how I'm looking after the family. They go ahead and do it. And I think that's not happening in just Tanzania. It's happening in very many countries where women are the backbone of the family, but not just the backbone in looking after the family, the financial backbone often. I'm sure Kawala will be speaking more about this. As you know, she's the first woman to be a presidential candidate in Cameroon, and she works a lot with women. And we know that, for example, in the displaced people's camps in northeastern Nigeria that I went to, you know, women are getting together and they're saying, we have got to find a way for this conflict to stop. It is affecting our lives, it is affecting our children's lives. So women are gathering, women are talking, women are delivering, but they don't get as much attention as men. I often say to young journalists when I talk to them in Africa, you know, as soon as your microphone comes out, who, it's a group of young men, all have their opinion. I respect their opinions, but often they're all telling me the same thing. So I say to them, just look behind mm -hmm. and you'll see a line of mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. They also have views. Go and talk to them because it is their views that will, you'll find will change your perceptions. They have opinions, they have knowledge, they have strengths. And these are the people we should be, if not profiling, at least let them have their say. Often they'll say, mm -mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, I don't, mm -mm. <laughs> you know? And you can't, if uh, Kawala said, you know, you journalists who parachute in and this, it won't work. If you've only got two minutes, you're not going to get their views. Yeah. Because you need to sit down, you need to talk to them, you need to get their confidence. You know, we journalists can be sometimes hugely arrogant. We feel that everybody should come and speak into our microphone. Why? Why? They don't know anything about us. They don't know, they don't know what we're going to relay. You need to have the confidence of these women. And once you do have, what they have to tell you is remarkable. Their stories are remarkable. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, you spoke a little bit about the youth um, and... There was much more, ran out of time. Yeah, <laughs> so, so maybe I might be getting at something you were going to say anyway. Um, I guess my question is, what would your message be to young Africans who have moved to the West, grown up in mm. the West, um, like me and Newell, um, and have gotten educated? What, are, what is our role in efficiently helping our respective countries? Mm. Um, because oftentimes, you know, you're told, go back, go back home, but um, sometimes it's to what? Um, and where do we start? Because we're still youngins, you know? Um, and so I th your message slash your advice would be awesome right now. <laughs> More later between us. Yeah? <laughs> but what? what a great question. Yeah. I think, you know, Reki, it's so difficult, as you say, it's not always possible 
to go back home and Ngawal to South Sudan, look at South Sudan. I was there for independence in 2011. South Sudan had just about made peace with Sudan. And then I was, you know, now South Sudan is fighting itself. So how can somebody like Ngawal go home right now? Mm. To be a refugee again, after she managed to leave behind a refugee camp and make her future in the US, it's a tough one. But I think what I would say is, don't forget your roots. You know, what you, the skills that you're learning here, what you are acquiring, the knowledge you are acquiring, you know, find a way to share that with your contemporaries on the continent. It's important. And learn from them. Because, of course, yes, we have the example of Ingawal, who lived in a refugee camp for most of her life and now is, you know, at college. That's fantastic. Congratulations. But you, you must give back. You know, we all have to give back. We all have to give back. Many of us, we, we are privileged, aren't we? L look at us. We have access to education. We have access to a good life. And yet the continent is there waiting. You may not be able to go back, but find ways that you can help young, especially young people, because you are our future, as I say. Yes, Nima. Um, my question goes back to um, the, the youthful move, movements that um, have undertaken way um, in our society. My question is, as you know, in South Sudan, um, there's a lot of ethnicities as there is in um, other parts of Africa. I have found it really hard to be an advocate um, for South Sudan because there's so many different ethnicities. Um, I think in our country, most people understand the issue. Nobody wants war. But I guess my question is like, how, how have um, other movements moved ahead with yeah. ethnic barriers? Like mm -hmm. how have, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm they actually become successful with issues that are within mm -hmm, mm -hmm. communities. That's a real tough one because you have, you know, let's take Rwanda and Burundi, Burundi at the moment, you know, which seem to have made progress in terms of the ethnic groups, Hutu and Tutsi. And as you know, it was Tutsis mainly who in Rwanda in 1994 were the victims and survivors of the genocide. It, if within your own country you can't make peace, be it South Sudan, be it Burundi, Democratic Republic of Congo, it's really tough because as you say, how can you be a peacenik when people see you as from this tribe or that ethnic group? They don't see you as a South Sudanese, which is what you are. Somali American, South Sudanese American, Ghanaian. If people see you as belonging to that tribe, so you will necessarily favor or sympathize with what they're doing, it makes it really tough. And especially, I think, young people who are, in inverted commas, more colorblind than you know, the older generations, like South Africans. I speak to young, I was going to talk about the born frees, they call them, those who didn't live through apartheid. They say, no, stop. Yes, you suffered. Yes, you fought for freedom. Yes, you liberated us. But it's our time now. And what we want is peace, progress, freedom more than democracy and an ability to be able to express ourselves and live our lives as South Sudanese or Somalis or Nigerians or South Africans or Malawians. You have to fight for it. I'm sorry, it's a struggle, but you know, maybe that's your fight. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ophelia. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. We have time for, I think we have to end it there. It's, we've run out of time. Thank you so much.
It was wonderful. Really great. Thank you so much.